Growing up here in, in uh, Canton, Ohio, this is my home parish, uh, I, like everyone else, you have to put things together that are the different influences in life growing up. And I grew up in, this, in an ethnic community, in you know, a Romanian Catholic church that's now our cathedral, um, with an expression and an atmosphere of Christianity that was very unlike that of all of the friends that I had growing up who were either Roman Catholic or Protestant and what have you. It was um, the spirit and ethos of, of Eastern Christianity with a different kind of liturgy and a different kind of spirituality. But the experience of the world around me was very much the Western context of, of uh, the society that I grew up in here, and in particular in Canton. Um, in this part of Ohio, we're very aware of the peace churches, because we've got large communities of Amish and Mennonite churches, um, the Church of the Brethren, the first settlers west of the Alleghenies uh, were Moravian missionaries, and uh, part of early Ohio history that I was just brought up with had to do with the, uh, the settlements at, at uh, Gnadenhutten and Schönbrunn, uh, where the, the Christians there died rather than engage in and the violence that was going on in the French and Indian War, I believe. And so, also growing up during the time of uh, the Vietnam War, uh, I became, with Kent State University, just a few miles from here, uh, very much sensitive to a lot of issues having to do with war and peace, 
um, the injustice that societies and nations are able to perpetrate, uh, the way that they're able to carry that off without uh, the population of a society ever becoming really conscious of it. And having um, a sense by the time I was 18 that I, when my number came up to be drafted into the military, it was right at the end of the World War, of um, the Vietnam War, that I was going to claim conscientious objector status, even though that never really crystallized in me as much more than a feeling or a notion that that's the way things ought to be. I had no theology of it at the time, clearly. But I knew conscientious objectors. I knew people from the peace churches. And, and uh, so it was just a part of, uh, again, my environment, the atmosphere that I had growing up. But it didn't mesh at all with my experience of the church and of gospel that came from this parish, run from Eastern Christianity. So um, there was that part of me that always uh, had a sense, kind of naturally, I think, for me, that, that, that violence is wrong, that war was not a way to solve problems, and that, uh, that especially violent nationalism um, was a perversion of, of what people were called and created out of nothingness by God to be. That sense was kind of always there, and it was kind of always in the background, even at a time when uh, later on, I came to really discover Eastern Christianity in a sense for the first time uh, through getting to know other Byzantine Catholics who uh, belonged to parishes that were not quite as ethnic and therefore celebrated the Divine Liturgy in English, which I had not experienced before. Uh, they celebrated in a style and fashion that was uh, uh, consistent with what I was reading and learning about what had just happened in those days with the Second Vatican Council. And these were Melkite Byzantine Catholics that I encountered while I, while I was a college student outside of Washington, D.C. And so through them, I had an experience of um, a kind of revitalization and really the beginning of, of my appreciation of what it means to be an Eastern Catholic and how I really did kind of fit in with that and belong with that. It was in 1980, and I think it was October, that Charlie was giving a retreat in Grottenwood, at, in Groton, Massachusetts, and invited me since he knew me from the seminary, to go and suggested that I participate and listen to his retreat, his workshop on Christian nonviolence, which in those days was entitled Christian Nonviolence. The great uh, option or obligation was the original title. And I went. And in the course of that weekend, everything came together. The early experience that I had, uh, the early sense that I had of the gospel as having something to do with nonviolence, the attraction that I felt to the peace churches and their witness here in this part of Ohio that I grew up with, a uh, rejection of war, and at the same time the spirituality of Eastern Christianity. It was all brought together in that one workshop. And I could show you now in the notes that I was taking that day, the, the section in my notes uh, where I wrote, this is it. I underlined it two or three times, the expression that God becomes a human being so that human beings could become totally God came out that I already was familiar with as a touchstone of Eastern Christian spirituality. And to me, of course, that meant Christian spirituality because that was what I was endeavoring to live. But the workshop made it very plain, syllogistically. If God is love, then the way of life that was being put forth that was just obviously the way of life that was worth living as a human being was to become totally love. So if love became humans so that humans could become totally love. And that was the experience and the expression of nonviolence that, that grasped me and became um, the cornerstone for me of response to the gospel, response to Jesus, and the only response that makes sense of the gospel and of Jesus, to my mind. How, how did your initial moment of conversion play out in your relationships with other people and with Charlie and so on? Well, Charlie was the spiritual director at the seminary, so I had the great grace 
of of having him of his availability in a way that he was available to no one else except perhaps his family. Um, because he was at the seminary all the time, and I had regularly scheduled sessions with him on a weekly basis. And so uh, it was not something that could, that as long as I chose not to, uh, would never have had the opportunity to go fallow. In fact, he started teaching a class then as well. And so uh, right after having done the workshop, he taught a course that he called, for the seminarians only at St. Gregory's, Consciousness and Spirituality, which put, together, which put things together um, on a very practical basis. He was also working on the follow-up to that original workshop, Christian Nonviolence Option or Obligation, that had to do with the practical and spiritual. Practical and spiritual, by the way, are essentially synonymous terms in Byzantine spirituality. What is practical is spiritual, and what is spiritual is ultimately practical. So uh, the practical spirituality of being a Byzantine fit perfectly with the kind of asceticism and ascetic discipline that was needed to bring about the conversion of consciousness that was necessary to, to support a heart and a mind that was centered on love and that was always trying to incarnate love. So I uh, had the regular spiritual direction with Charlie, we had the course that he was taking, and before long, people started to show up at the Sunday liturgy at the seminary. People like John Leary from the Catholic Worker and the other the members of the Catholic Worker, people from a group in Needham, Massachusetts, a peace and justice group, another peace and justice group in Worcester, Massachusetts. And before, before long, the Sunday liturgy was full of all kinds of people who were also making the same connection between Byzantine spirituality and non, the, the, witness of the non, witness to the nonviolent gospel. And so it all fit together for me for one kind of brief but perfect moment. Uh, my life at the seminary, the classes I was taking in theology, spiritual direction, uh, all worked to keep a kind of momentum going so that, like it or not, I knew that um, there was just no other way um, I was ever going to be able to put the gospel together in other terms. Simply, Jesus doesn't make sense trying to read him as in any way um, providing a foundation in the heart and mind of God for uh, act, acts of enmity or violence or retaliation on the part of his followers. And that was the cornerstone that put the rest of my theological edifice together. Without that, I no longer was able to make, make sense of anything. But with that, all of the stuff that's hard to rationalize or to, to appreciate, perhaps, in, uh, in uh, Catholic teaching, especially the demands of Catholic morality, individual morality as well as social morality, uh, all of it made perfect, perfect sense. Because all of it was what was required uh, if you wanted to become love. And falling short of that was um, where all of the stuff that, that people tend to look at as prohibitions about Catholic morality comes from. So it worked out very well. Unfortunately, unfortunately, well, maybe not unfortunately. I, I didn't stay in the seminary. I had stopped out before and I decided, decided to stop out again. And this time I thought it was for good. I planned on it being for good. Um, and to a large measure, I think it was my understanding of the gospel and how it was meant to be lived and how far short of that I was coming uh, that led me out of the seminary um, because I didn't think that that was a place that was going to bring me any closer to my goal of, of becoming love. Uh, it could have, but perhaps not for me at the time. And by grace, again, I had the chance uh, to stay in the area, the Boston area, after I left the seminary to work on the staff of the Pax Christi USA Center on Conscience and War, which Charlie and Gordon Zahn and a few others had just founded in response to the renewed, uh, the law renewing registration for compulsory military service that President Jimmy Carter had at that time uh, just uh, put into effect. Um, 
as a result of, I think it was the Soviet uh, military involvement in Afghanistan, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so from the seminary, stopping out of the seminary, again, leaving the seminary, I was able to immerse myself in the world and with the people of the spirit and life of Christian nonviolence through working directly with something that always affected me, uh, which was working with folks who were conscientious objectors to military service. Did you find anyone within your work with the uh, Pax Christi and so on that were leaning more towards the just war theory and didn't hold a total adherence to Christian nonviolence? There were people, of course, not too many of the people that I worked with, but even the, the just war or Pax Christi people uh, had an understanding of the just war that virtually ruled it out as a human possibility. Um, Gordon Zahn, in particular, uh, one of few American Catholic conscientious objectors during World War, World war II, uh, was very, very articulate in the terms of the just war and always argued his stance on that basis, at least when we were working together. I began working at, pa at the Pax Christi Center in the early 80s when the anti-nuclear movement was in full swing. So not only were we uh, responding to the new requirement of registration for selective military service, and at that time there was uh, a lot of preparation and activity and involvement involving the, uh, the second special session on nuclear disarmament at the United Nations, and at the same time, the U.S. Catholic hierarchy was working on its pastoral to address that situation. It was called the Peace Pastoral. The full title of it was The Challenge of Peace, God's Promise, and Our Response. Gordon was involved, was, was an expert helping and counseling different bishops who were working on the draft of that document. So I heard him articulating a just war position uh, very, very clearly as an anti-war position uh, the entire time that I was there. And so uh, working with him um, was very illustrative of where and how the just war theory, if it's to mean anything at all in the life of the church, how it means, where it means, and where it's important, and what it's not, uh, what it's not meant to do and what it's not ever been meant to do has been to justify war. It's been meant to set the criteria by which war, if ever, could be justified. And in the case of what was going on in that pastoral in response to the anti-nuclear movement, um, we tried for as clear a rejection of the nuclear arms race on the basis of just war as much as possible. At the same time, when that, the first draft of that document was coming up to the bishops uh, for their vote, the first bishops' conference meeting that I ever participated in, I went to, to hand out a small booklet that at now Father Emmanuel Charles McCarthy had written called An Epistle to the Church of the 20th Century, Christian Nonviolence, The Great Failure, The Only Hope. The bottom line of that was a call to the bishops not to, to issue an unclear bugle call, but to reject, uh, reject not only nuclear war, but all war at all times, under all circumstances, and not to put out a document that was again going to um, provide cover for Christian participation in war. When I was working at the Pax Christi Center, of course, Gordon Zahn was famous for having really unearthed the story of blessed Franz Jägerstetter, uh, an Austrian peasant who was a conscientious objector to service in Hitler's army in Austria during the Second World War. In many ways, uh, Gordon's counterpart on the other side of the war and on the other side of the pond. And we used the film that had been based on his book, In Solitary Witness, as part of a program uh, that we took to various dioceses and peace and justice uh, offices of different dioceses uh, as we talked about um, preparing each diocese, because this was the work that we were doing, preparing Catholic dioceses to deal with Catholic conscientious objectors that would surface within their diocese. And so, uh, Watching that film again and again and again in solitary witness was, um, again, it was just uh, part of the atmosphere of those days that um, constantly reinforced for me that this, 
this was the only gospel that was the gospel. It was the only way of, of understanding the gospel that responded positively to St. Francis's question, is it not possible to live the gospel? Because the answer is yes, but these are the consequences, the full gospel. Gordon was a great influence in those days because as a man of letters, as a scholar, as a different kind of person from Father McCarthy, he provided another side in a sort of softer, rounder atmosphere. The case that, that Father McCarthy makes for Christian nonviolence is unambiguous. It's clear. And you can't help but realize that it, it calls for nothing short of a, of a radical reorientation of your life and everything that you've ever thought about the gospel before. Not an easy thing. And he comes across uh, not only in his presentation of it, but in his living out of it as somebody who, who deals with it in a kind of soldierly fashion, with that kind of grit and determination, strength of will and, and a willingness to put up with hardship and, and recognizing that that hardship is going to be there, the cross is always going to be there, the sacrifices will be there. Gordon, on the other hand, uh, was at least a light of a different sort, a little bit, a little more scholarly, um, a little more at home in the world, a little more at, at peace with, with uh, the structures of, of the world that we live in. And, uh, and yet, there were the two of them uh, of being of tremendous positive influence, uh, certainly in my life, but as far as I could see um, in the life of the church in the United States and ultimately, I think, worldwide. I think we'd have to say worldwide. Both of them speaking in their own ways on behalf of the God made visible in Jesus Christ as love. And so I look at Gordon and with his gentleness and his kindliness, he was very avuncular. And I would remember that love, after all, means love. That there's something to gentleness. The gentleness had to be a part of, of, uh, of the love that you incarnated. If you incarnated a ferocious love, that may be wonderful and it may be moving, but it wasn't going to be love for me. It wasn't going to be my experience of love. So, <clears throat> and he wasn't the only witness. There was an extraordinary young fellow there, three years younger than I was at the time, by the name of John Leary, part of the Haley House Catholic Worker, who, more than anybody else at the time, looked like, if I could put it this way, and forgive me my um, kind of light speech. But if, if the teaching that Charlie was offering was the mold, and John Leary was the willing clay, he came out the image of what it was, the, the living image of what it was that Charlie was teaching me. And so he was a witness in flesh and blood in his activity, in his words, in his demeanor, and what it was that he was doing. I could see it happening in front of me every day. What, what, what I was hearing uh, from Charlie, from Father Emanuel, was not pie in the sky. I could see what it did to a human being and made it something really worthwhile, really something attractive, something that moved my heart. I knew that it was love. It was clearly love. That was who John Leary was, and that's... Uh, that's what came out in absolutely everything that he did with great care and precision and kindness. So it was more than the Dickensian best of times and worst of times. It was, it was, it was the time of my life. It was the, the, the kind of crucible when a lot of things were being put together for me and I had the theology of nonviolence. I had a, a, a job working in, in uh, conscientious objection. I had people around me who represented the God who was attracting me, who were able to be living icons of this God for me at the time. And uh, it was a time of incredible blessing and uh, grace in my life. At what point in your development did the teachings of Charlie McCarthy become incarnated in you and be become such a part of you that you use your own language and your own experience to articulate it to other people. 
I'm not sure that I have my own language for this yet. Uh, perhaps I do, uh, but when, when, um, when I'm giving workshops, as I do on nonviolence, uh, a lot of times at the parochial level or at the level of clergy conference, conferences for the clergy of other dioceses, uh, and even for Catholic worker groups, I'm very aware of the origin of the material, sometimes word for word, that I use. And I've talked about it with him on many occasions. And, and uh, he's always encouraged me to just not to regard it as, um, as his either. Because if it's, if it's the truth, it's the truth. If it's gospel, it's gospel. And he does have a unique way of putting things together, and that's uh, in terms of an argument or in terms of, as a teaching. And if it is the case that God has allowed me to internalize that enough, um, then I, I'm, I'm happy for that. But I don't know how it happened. I don't know when it happened. Like I told you, I can't even say that it happened yet. But if it's the case, then then it would only be because it's, it's the God who's never gone away. Once he showed up in Grottenwood in October of 1980, that's the only God who's ever shown God's self to me. You were the, one of the few, if not the only, bishop who actively spoke in an, in an official capacity against the Iraq War. Um, and that took a, lot of, took a lot of inner strength to take that position. Um, how much of that position was influenced by Charlie? Every Christian is responsible before God for his or her conscience. The fact that we go about our lives as Christians in a body, as a body, doesn't relieve us of our own individual responsibilities. Whatever they may be um, as Christians and therefore within a body, my part in the body that is my diocese was clear. And I felt I had to say something, whether it would be well received by uh, the people or not, um, or by anyone else. Uh, to warn of the moral danger that this war was posing for uh, any of our people and to express my judgment of it at the time. Recognizing that other people were going to come to their own conclusions, clearly, but that didn't absolve me from expressing what my conclusions were. And so I did. And so the letter was written. The question you asked was how much uh, of Charlie's teaching was, was influential in that. It's all the same cloth. The gospel of nonviolence, the way, the way Father McCarthy has articulated it, um, is simply my vocabulary for these things. And so, uh, the way the letter uh, is written, the way it's expressed, um, I think expresses as well what he would have to say. I don't think that there's substantively any disagreement between us as far as the war in Iraq is concerned and our, you know, our judgment about it. Uh, he has been his, and I don't want to say he personally. He personally perhaps, but that's a different story. It's his, it's his articulation of the gospel message that is the faith language that I use because, as I've said, it's, it's, it's the one that, that, that makes sense. Of course, I read other theologians. Of course, I read, you know, I read saints and mystics all of the time, and I have to put it together into, the, into my own heart and into my own spirit. And it gets hard to figure out where things come from eventually. But even though he expresses uh, the thought much better, much more plainly, much more forcefully and articulately than I do, I think, that uh, there's no disagreement uh, between my letter and, and what uh, Father McCarthy has to say about the war. And I don't think that I would have written the letter or perhaps had the courage to write the letter, but for his 
teaching and his witness and the part that he's played in my life as a Christian. Amen. Mm-hmm.